Um, I've been, I've been, I guess, a transhumanist for maybe about 15 years. Um, so I've been in the in the space for a while, and I know some of the folks here uh, done a lot of stuff together. Uh, Regina and I actually started this Acceleration Studies Foundation company 12 years ago, a uh, nonprofit. Um, and where I've taken transhumanism is towards foresight, because for me, getting people to think about the future in a more methodical, careful way, and valuing that, is I think the way we can get them to understand some of the issues that we feel passionately about. Um, and I define transhumanism a little differently from some people. Um, for me, transhumanism is basically humanism with the recognition that to be a human is to use technology to become something more than your biological self. So the very first humans that picked up the very first rocks that started synchronizing their squeaks around the fire, they started using technology, language is a technology, uh, a rock, a club is a technology, and this is a technology, in a kind of a runaway effect, runaway self-improving effect. So, so that's what a human is, I think, on any planet where they emerge. It's an organism, a biological organism that uses technology to become something more than their biological self. So having people to see that and to see technology from a really broad perspective as I think going to be tremendously helpful to us as we go forward. So my definition of transhumanism is a little bit different from some folks. And um, that transhumanitarianism that Hank talked about is, I think, one of the key features of this, uh, staying really close to the humanism of what we're doing. So, okay, so I'm going to talk about three things. Um, technological change, uh, foresight, my approach to it in the 12 years I've been a futurist. And, um, and then the main topic of our, of our, uh, our brief here, uh, or of our, our conference here. So, um, first, um, in technological change, I, I divide it up into 10 areas that are important, but I think there's only two that really drive accelerating change, which is the reason we started our nonprofit, to understand things that go faster every year. And it's those two that we really need to figure out. So before I talk about that, um, there's now 23 places you can get a master's or a PhD in future studies or foresight. Uh, I got mine at the Houston program uh, back in 2007. Um, and uh, I recommend anyone who's interested in foresight to consider getting a, uh, um, getting a degree in it because it really is a wonderful way in to pushing people to think about the future in every organization. Um, good futures try and tell weevil stories. Remember these weevil? Weevil is a, is a, is a <laughs> weevil's a wobble, but they don't fall down. Most stories that are being told in the futurist space fall down if you get them in front of somebody who's very critical. So as David Brin says, a uh, wonderful science fiction writer and author of The Transparent Society, um, you know, criticism is the best antidote to error. So get your stories out in front of very critical people, and if they survive, then tell them in a larger group. But uh, I think that's one of the most powerful ways for us to increase our credibility is to really look for just the Weeble stories. So one of the Weeble stories of the future, or Weeble models, that I really found valuable was uh, Dater's model. Uh, I got this early in my education. He runs the, he just retired from the University of Hawaii Future Studies Program, um, which is the only PhD in the U.S. for future studies. Um, he said there's basically four stories of change. We've got your standard S curve, and then you've got your life cycle curve, right? Anyone of us who are over 50 know about this part of the curve. <laughs> and then there's another S curve that's constantly coming, that's going to disrupt your game, right? So there's four stories of change in any interesting situation. There's continuation, you know, exponential growth, could be low or fast, depending. Limited discipline, declining collapse, and transformation. And I, th I think re recognizing that and understanding that there's different people that, are, that see the world from those four perspectives at any time is really helpful. Another incredibly helpful curve to understand besides those four sections of the, of the S and the decline and the life cycle curve that I mentioned to you is the Kuznets curve. Now, Simon Kuznets got a Nobel Prize for basically saying that income inequality, as technology goes into an environment, and this happened first in the Industrial Revolution in, in uh, England, creates incredible income inequality 
And then in the second phase, it stays unequal. And then in the third phase, people vote in the social entitlements and the redistributions, and then the income inequality goes down. We've seen 60 years of increasing income inequality in the United States, but that's actually a Kuznets curve from incredible wealth that was created from this kind of IT world that we're now in, this IT and automation and global world, right? And that, that decline is going to happen, and there's a good book uh, uh, giving you one of the Kuznets curves uh, uh, you might find interesting. Another really helpful curve to know is the J curve, right? We all know this. This is kind of things going faster, and it's not exponential. This is super exponential. There's actually a knee to the curve, you see? Kind of a state switch. And this is actually energy flow density in complex adaptive systems in the universe. So read this book if you want to understand why actual accelerating complexification seems to be built into the physics of the universe. It's, it's amazing, okay? And the things that are at the top of the curve now are not humans anymore, not even our culture. They're IT, right? Okay, very helpful to understand. Uh, and then Gerard Peel, a Scientific American, 1972 the editor, uh, wrote this crazy book, The Acceleration of History. And it's one of the early books that basically argued that we're moving to this kind of tech singularity, right? Which everyone in this room, I'm sure, knows about, right? This idea. And various people have different opinions for when this happens, uh, you know, mid 20th century, second half of the 20th century seems to be where the people that I find most credible are kind of cent centered, right? And so something really interesting is coming, right? And we as transhumanists realize that and we want to use that in a powerful, positive way. Uh, economies also do this acceleration. This is Angus Madison's famous GDP curve for a thousand years in Western Europe. And look at the state switch right there, 1850, right? GDP went from here to this on a thousand year scale. And why did it do it? Uh, Bernstein's birth plenty gives you the four, a four factor model that really helps you understand this curve and, and why we're in this incredible blow up of wealth and productivity. Okay, it's really, it's really the science and the machines. That's the wealth that we really are building, right? On top of our biological wealth, which is kind of saturated. Okay, our biological ability to do things, okay? So we're in a world where we're seeing accelerating change, and you know a lot of human systems they grow at annual rates that are that are low. A few things are blowing up at the moment, like healthcare, analytics, India's organic food market, 25% a year growth. You know, wow, that's great. But that's gonna there's an S curve to that, isn't there? The things that are on that red transformational curve that I, that I showed you are things like Moore's law, and even faster than Moore's law, uh, growing at 55% a year. All the digital information we're tagging the world, right? That information is basically creating kind of a, a soil that is that the machines are going to be reading, and that's how the semantic web is going to emerge in the conversational interface and the AI that we all know is is we're actually building it right. The biggest complexity construction project humans have ever been in, engaged in. That that's the web, right? It's amazing. Could you speak John, into you the speak? microphone? Yeah. yeah, I'll try. Is it on? Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, so I parse the world in 10 areas of technology change. I have an article online with that title if you want to read it. And for me, these two blue and blue, they're different. These are the two that are accelerating. They're kind of baked into the universe that sit, complex adaptive systems in the universe, they blow up their ability to process information and, and create information, and they blow up in their ability to scale down into the nanospace. That's how the acceleration continues, right? Humans can do it a little bit now in amazing ways, right? We can, we can actually do neutrino communication. We can build small quantum computers. It's amazing that we can go that far down into the nanospace. But it's really that acceleration into that space where you can do more better with less that drives that incredible acceleration. So all the other changes seem to be driven by those two. Okay. And so leaders need to use the strongest levers of nano and infotech and mind the hype. They need to see that everything is actually on a hype cycle, as Gartner said, right? And there's a good book uh, by Ben and Raskino, Mastering the Hype Cycle. You know, people are going to try and pull the money out of the hype first, ahead of everybody else, right? Get your money, get their profits, and then everything crashes into a trough of disillusionment because the technology is still, you know, three to five years away from being ready. And then finally, and then the smart people are going to buy up all these companies after you know, they run out of cash or whatever because the hype came too early. And then finally you get into the plateau of productivity at the end, right? And that's when the technology starts to exponentially scale. So all of our technologies do this and we as transhumanists have to be careful to recognize 
where something is in, in the stage of hype, right? So for foresight, for the last two years I've been writing a book and I've been baking it down into what are my, the critical things I've learned in the last 12 years as a futurist. Um, first, this three P's model. Roy Amar in 1981, Institute for the Future, came up with this model. He said all futures really can be understood in three different ways. Possible futures, probable futures, what's going to happen whether you want them to or not. Right? You're going to get older tomorrow. Right? Sun's going to rise. I a lot of probable things. Okay? What you could do, and then what you want to do, what you're steering toward. Mm -hmm. right? And so these are the kind of groups in, in an organization of different people that are interested in the different types of things, and they actually see the world, the people that really are into one of these three, in three different ways. The, the possible, the entrepreneurs and the artists and the creators are all about trees and possibility and creating variety. The predictors, the forecasters, the risk managers, the legal guys, they're all about funneling towards certainty, the things I can predict and manage that uncertainty, right, in a predictable way. And then these guys are all, they see the world in terms of adaptive landscapes, you know, who the competitors are, how can I knock them out, how can I jump, uh, up, scale up uh, uh, in the landscape faster than somebody else, right? The trees funnel the landscapes. This is a protein folding funnel. Funneling is built into physics, okay? And so is the tree of life, right? This is the so-called Evo-Devo perspective, right? Evolutionary, uh, diversity, developmental funneling. Okay? Both things are constantly happening. Parts of the future are predictable and parts are unpredictable. Right? It's statistically predictable, in my opinion, that you know, organisms like us are going to emerge in Earth-like planets all over the universe, and they're all going to develop technology, and that acceleration is going to continue. And what I just, that's hand-waving what I just said. Okay? That's systems theory. That's not science yet. Okay? But as a futurist, you have to have a model. You have to have a way of parsing the world, and this, for me, has been the most useful one. It turns out to be a good book called The KAI, which will show you the people in your organization who think as, in terms of trees, funnel, and landscapes. The innovators, the predictor protectors, and the bridgers. These are the best managers, those people who can kind of see both sides. Okay? So you can take this and say, about, see whether you have enough of those people. And if you're protecting each of those three people or groups, because each, each of those need to be protected to do what they like to do. Okay? Gallup did a fantastic book uh, called Strengths Finder that broke all of our strengths. It's kind of like an MBTI, but for workplace strengths, into 34 different strengths. For 14 bucks, you can take the test and you can find out what your top five strengths are. Cool thing about this model, though, like the KAI, which sorts you into three buckets, this one sorts you into four buckets one foresight, strategy, and three that are doing buckets. Are you a doer? Are you an influencer? Or are you a relator? And all three of these are fundamental workplace concepts for creating things that humans care about. And Scott Page wrote a lovely book, The Difference, about the importance of having cognitive diversity for all the hard problems. And he has all the evidence in there for why cognitively diverse teams outcompete people that are teams that are not. Okay? So if you care about change, you can put all interesting change into what are called decision cycles, or actually they're called perception, decision, action cycles, okay, PDA cycles. How we see the world biases what we can decide, and then what we decide biases and constrains our action. And so uh, the Deming Quality Loop, the Strategic Planning Loop, the Agile Development Lean Startup, they're all actually these decision PDA cycle loops, and I call it uh, the do loop. So. It's something as simple as knowing where you are, using three-piece foresight, that's the C, and then here's Gallup's three do steps, getting somewhere, execution, with others, influence, keeping them happy, relating, and then you have to have a review step. Right? Am I on target? If not, what do I do to get back on target? Then you go back to learning. So that's learn, see, do, review, and Everyone has a different model for what foresight is. This is my best model that I think might be useful for some of you guys in the organizational world. And this book, The Foresight Guide, will be out next month. I'm putting the whole thing online for free. Uh, it'll also be on Amazon. Um, and um, at foresightguide.com. And you can, 
you can see, you know, here's the eight skills. There's three do skills, there's three seeing skills, there's learning and there's reviewing. And, you know, maybe this model is too complicated. Maybe it's not complicated enough. But I've been able to map all the foresight things, that's what's in gold here, all the foresight things that organizations do into each of these eight skills, and I'm not missing anything. This is all the stuff that's taught in the MBA school, and I've just reoriented it to thinking ahead, which of course is one of the key things transhumanists really care about doing, right? We think we, we, think we can see a little further down the technology and, and uh, future space than some of our friends, okay? And then the last thing I'd like to say is that whole cycle, it, it, it can be ground to a halt if you don't have, if you don't have good relating. It goes back to Hank's transhumanitarianism, right? If you're not relating well to other people and caring about them empath empathetically and improving things for them, we are a cooperative species until we're exploited or amygdala hijacked. So you can either abuse us or you can get us scared. <laughs> In both cases, trust just stops, right? And so if we can figure out how to keep that trust strong and dealing, deal with, I'm going to show you some slides in the next section for ways that people electronically, and I, the IT <coughs> layer that I told you about that's moving the fastest, electronically we're going to be able to find the people who are the wolves in sheep's clothing, right? The trolls and the clickbaiters and all those people. Have you seen the new page rank algorithm for Google? Did you see that it came out last week? It's going to, the, the AI is smart enough, the knowledge graph is smart enough that they're going to fact check pages, and if you have an anti-vax page or whatever, you know, something stupid, right, that's factually incorrect, they're going to lower its page rank. That's the AI. Yeah. Imagine what's going to happen, imagine when it gets to the level of click, all that clickbait you see now on the bottom, <laughs> bottom of all of those interesting sites, right, you know it's clickbait, you, unfortunately you click on it every once in a while, oh, that's a waste of my time. <laughs> imagine when it gets that smart that it's actually dark, trying to know your values and it's pushing that stuff down. And all the people that are trolling out there, and all the people that are manipulating other people, all the liars and Decepticons, and you actually are able to see a, 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 a reputation cloud for those people in the tools that you're using, because that's how smart this thing that we're building is going to be. Okay? It's an amazing world. Okay? I'm very excited about it. All right. So, transhumanist uh, stuff. So, <clears throat> we're doing good here. I'm going to talk about some trends and strategies and issues that I think are valuable for us to think about this world that we're creating and, and, and how different it's going to be from what you know, our, our parents grew up in. And these are mostly IT and a little bit of nano, because like I said, I think those are the two that really are different from everything else. We, we don't realize how different they are, but it seems to be kind of built into what we're doing. Our consciousness is, ab abs is of course, an IT system, isn't it, that was kind of self-built by these replicating uh, gene protein regulatory networks, right? So IT, information technology, that's, this is the best, most complicated thing we know on the planet for that, right, today, right? But possibly not very much longer, okay? And of course, we did it using incredible nanotechnology, right? A eukaryote cell is just ridiculously more uh, uh, efficient and miniaturized version of information processing than any other biological system, right? And, and 100 trillion neurons in the space of three uh, pounds of ma electromagnetic uh, uh, flesh, right? Is just the most amazing thing we've ever seen. I mean, as, as humans looking at the universe. And I'm arguing that that seems to be part of what, what our purpose is, this this ITification and this nano drive that we have. Okay, so we look at some short-term things, and like I said, we're seeing increasing rich-poor divides for 60 years in the U.S., and we think, well, could that eventually stop? Well, yeah, it looks like it's on a pendulum, right? It happens because the technology creates so much wealth at first. We're also seeing, you probably saw that new study that was in Forbes like a week ago, that the U.S. millennials scored 23 out of, 23rd out of 23 OECD countries, and in uh, kind of adult skills tests, right? And to me, this is a Kuznets issue. Remember how I said things get worse before they get better? We get all this incredible, incredible IT and, and distractions and addictions available to us. We're the leading country on the planet. So 
you know, so I go to a, a, an airport and what do I see kids doing on their beautiful, you know, netbooks? I mean, they're binge watching, you know, uh, Netflix uh, House of Cards, right? I mean, they're just disappearing down the rabbit hole of the first stage electronics. Okay, so it's no wonder that their literacy and practical math and problem solving skills have gone down compared to their parents, maybe a little bit. They're gaining all these incredible new skills, but they're also being dehumanized a little way, a little bit. And that's what Kuznets curves do. At first, they dehumanize us, and then they rehumanize us. So we can imagine a third stage version of these technologies that's kind of watching the kids, they're, they're wearing it, and, and that kind of guides them. Ah, you know, you have this calculus test coming up in a couple of weeks, I know you're kind of weak on it, but I was, you know, I was watching you and you didn't really see my stuff at that. So here, would you like a three minute version? And uh, you know, play a little game afterwards. And of course the kid says, sure. And there's two ways to deal with those third generation technologies. You can continue to lean back and have a wall of vacation future, right? And some people will do that. But when a technology goes third generation, you can also lean forward. Everybody who uses YouTube as their primary way of watching the web today is in the lean forward mode, aren't they? You're just constantly leaning forward to get interesting information. It sucks that you can't turn off those commercials by paying a little extra yet. I'm waiting for them to roll. They announced it, but I'm waiting for them to roll that feature out. It also sucks that I can't find out what each of you is watching and get my little one hour summary version. Or we have got 90 minutes. Give me my 90 minute summary version of all the coolest YouTube stuff that all of my transmitters friends have been watching. Right? That is a way that you turn the six hours. Um, is it six hours a day? What's the American Time Use Survey say? How much <coughs> the Ameri average American is free? Eight to nine. It's six hours per day of television. This is not. This is not. Yeah. Maybe it's maybe it's screen time. Yeah. So that's the way you turn that into an incredibly effective uh, educational tool, right? And we're on the edge of that. So true internet television. That's one of those exciting things uh, that I recommend anybody who's in the Silicon Valley space who, who wants to disrupt, you know, uh, media. Boy, that's going to be that's going to be amazing, and we're we're getting close to it. You know, Apple TV is not going to be that, right? Okay, I mean, it's going to take some kid in their dorm room to design that next system where you can mute the commercials on. You know, you can get the micro payments, and the twenty somethings are going to route around the damage. They'll be watching that, and then everyone else is going to be forced. <laughs> the big guys are going to be forced to use that model, right? I only want commercials coming into my home that either reflect my interests or are local. Right? Without that, I don't want it. It's, it's irritating. It's not educational to me. And people are going to get that kind of media. They're going to demand it. And then the world's going to be a lot more um, educated place. Okay? All right. So it's always tough in a short discussion to figure out what to focus on. Uh, how are we doing on time? Give me my, give me my, my big overview here. Five minutes? Yeah, you got eight more minutes. Eight? Good. Okay. So I got five for the. So I'll probably just do. Three of Q and A. Then, so there's a lot of really good stuff out there. You know, do you know there's 150,000 people using Feasturology subreddit now? It's mm. <laughs> blown up. Okay, there's huge amateur knowledge base. Pinterest is a fantastic way to look at the future of visual things now. Blown up. People built it in the last couple of years, right? Uh, or soon will be that. Um, all kinds of crowd competition happening. Do you know that the second half of the jobs bill emerges in uh, October of this year? Did you hear about that? Jobs bill two. You're going to be able to crowd fund or crowd found companies. You don't have to be an accredited angel investor. This is one of Obama's big kind of pushes, right? You can do it already on AngelList. You have to be an accredited investor. And people get around it with syndicates now on an AngelList. They're just trying to erode it so that you can crowd found, not just crowd fund, but crowd found companies. That's coming. That's really soon. Okay. And we're, we're looking for trustable transparency and immunity. David Grimm wrote this beautiful book who said, you know, democratic societies are happy with a transparent world as long as 20 times more of the cameras are in our hands. <laughs> Think about the power of that. So sell that perspective on people and then they're less worried because you always have a WikiLeaks or somebody out there to keep the, the, the top down guys accountable. Simulations are going 
you know, they're going like crazy, and they're, they're fast-paced. You can learn things in a simulation in, you know, one-tenth of the time you can in, in physical, or even quicker. You can do 20 hours of drive sharp, play this game at Rover 55, your peripheral vision widens so much that your accident rates go down 50% for two years. These guys are based in Nor NorCal. They're, they're based in uh, San Francisco, okay, uh, Merzenich, okay. This works. Think of the future of those kinds of games when, we're, we're, when they're kind of baked in and we're wearing them and playing them all the time, right? And, and they're serious games, you know, the future, uh, you want to be a future uh, doctor, lawyer, whatever you play, your serious game. And machine-built knowledge bases are blowing up, okay? They're really getting smart, and that book on the top is a really good one for that. Uh, there's that smart TV that I mentioned. Uh, boy, it's close. Um, and there's all kinds of amazing platforms for people getting together to try and figure out the future. And together with, with, tool, with, with methods and machines and these kind of experts, they're seeing stuff much further. Palantir is the most famous of them all, but there's a lot of them out there now. Um, the conversational interface. Uh, that's basically here now. You've seen the Amazon Echo, right? If that doesn't impress you, it was a $150 talking alarm clock. <laughs> Incredible. And Google and Facebook are now the largest countries on the planet, right? They just, in terms of user base, just passed the two largest physical countries. And we're going to see one wearable smartphone per child very soon, okay? What can you do with one wearable smartphone per child? Well, you can lean forward and learn English or any other major language while you're learning your main language. The system's actually going to listen in. You're going to hear the Twi word. I was in Ghana two years ago, and uh, you know, we got to help out some kids, and, uh, and we brought them a lot of tech. And, um, they're learning the Twi word for, ink, for dog. They can look down on their smartphone, and they can see the English language word. But, get taught the English language word, right? Get spoken it, and they can play a little game that shows them, uh, that makes, uh, assesses their learning ability. Well, a bunch of kids are probably going to use the Skype real-time language translator. Do you see that? Yes. Yeah. Mandarin English is probably the next one coming out right now. It's Spanish English. It's real-time. It's a babble fish. It's a real-time babble fish, right? Microsoft and Bing, Research and Bing announced it uh, for Spanish. So most kids are going to lean back, and that's how they're going to deal with English. But the kids who lean forward and actually learn our language while they're growing up, remember Sapper-Whorf hypothesis? They're going to think in terms of our language. We have a million words in English language. It's the largest language. We've stolen more words from more cultures to build our language. It's ridiculously mimetically complex. So any kid who leans forward rather than leans back and learns that language while they're growing up, sponges it up off their wearable smartphone, well, that kid can now, their LinkedIn rating for English is going to be 80%. They're going to be hired for these virtual companies that everyone's going to be creating and crowdfunding in another 10, maybe 15 years, right? I'm arguing 500 million new English speakers. That's how many we can see from these technologies. That's how fast they're growing, blowing up. That's how cheap these, these uh, smartphones like the Zomi phones and the, the, um, that one in India, I forget what it's called, the $60 phone in India. That's how cheap these smartphones are blowing up. Right? They're going to be even cheaper and more amazing. So this IT future is going to be powerful. Last two slides, group nets. People, kids who are connected up are going to outcompete kids who are isolated. Because there are going to be these cognitive diversity measures, and they're going to have these measures to keep the people, the scammers and the manipulators, from manipulating the other kids. You can't ask a question until you've been asked, asked a question yourself, right? So everyone has to contribute to the pool. There's already kids growing up who have these Facebook experiences, can't remember whether it was them or one of their friends. So they call that the symbiont, right? The symbiont moment. So these group nets are going to start out competing solitary kids. And that's tremendously valuable for shifting some of their perspectives and helping the people who are uh, uh, mentally, have mental issues, right? Um, and so the weirdest thing are these digital twins, you know? And, you know, Viv and uh, Cortana, right? Those are two big, big projects right now for creating these. Probably Sensei, probably Monica has one. These are projects for creating these kind of digital versions of you, right? They are going to be amazing. 
you're going to use these things to guide how you, what you watch, uh, what you might want to buy, what you might want to vote. That's the most exciting thing to me. <laughs> Imagine when you have a lobby twin looking after your personal interests, helping you see which initiative is going to be the most useful the next, you know, in your local city to represent your interests. And everyone's going to be running these with their own version. Some people are going to run the open source where I want that total control over the interface and my algorithms. Other people are going to, you know, I'm going to use the Comcast Xfinity version and just do what they tell me, right? But as long as the people who care the most about creating positive change, the lean forward people, whatever percentage those are, as long as those people have control over their own algorithms and their own data, right? Which is going to be a fundamental thing that we care about, right? Privacy and, and control. Um, the power of these things for representing your personal interests are just going to keep exploding. And that, to me, is a very exciting and interesting world. Oh, John, we should take a question. Then. Yeah. So the last thing I should say is, is um, I've got a little community, uh, the Brain Preservation Foundation, that is actually uh, trying to validate that two different approaches for preser preserving people's brains actually work after you, um, after you die. And I think helping people understand themselves in terms of their information and how to give that to the future if they want, to their kids, if they just want to give their memories, or actually come back if they want, right? Is I think it would be tremendously helpful for people. And I started a company around this book that I'm uh, publishing next month, The Foresight Company. And we're trying to help people, trying to create this foresight database of people around the world uh, so that we can get better at telling uh, these stories that we care so much about. Okay, three questions. Uh, 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 okay. Uh, Is that Randall? Yeah. Hey, Randall. Yeah. Why don't we take Randall, Barbara, and then you back there? Go ahead, Randall. All right, so um, I, I really like all the technology that helps you find what you, you all are already interested in, digital twin, all that kind of stuff. I know how there can be too much of a good thing. Yeah. So one of the things I'm sort of worried about here is the lack of exposure, that you end up just in the echo chamber, the own group that you like to be in anyway. And on Facebook, you can see that already. It's and fantastic, yeah. I would say Facebook is a first-gen effect. So people have arguing about the negatives of spending too much time, it comes like a rabbit hole, kind of like the, <coughs> kind of the Netflix binge washing. It's exactly that. First gen, it's a first gen effect, and it is a filter bubble, and it does focus you too much on kind of exhibitionism and things like that. And you can't easily filter those things out and say dislike. But none of that stuff's built in yet. So Eli Parishioner's The Filter Bubble is a, the best go-to book for that problem that I know. And Scott Page's The Difference is the best go-to book that I know for why cognitive diversity crushes people who are in filter balls. So the people who set up their group net so that they have those people who disagree with them, those people who think differently from them, those people are going to totally outperform on all the hard problems. So I, don't, I have confidence that the data, the evidence, will show us that setting up these echo chambers is bad for you. So I think it's an important it's, it's an important problem. Just because it's bad for you doesn't mean that the majority of people might not flock there. So I agree. Do you, remember I talked about the who's the, the, the uh, lean forward and lean back people? Yeah. I'm going to say something controversial. I think that 80 percent of the people want to continue to lean back mm -hmm. and want to get more qualified. Yep. But as long as 20 percent of us, the 20 percent who do 80 percent of the work, the 20 percent who feel 80 percent responsible. Whoever those people are, okay, as long as those people are leaning forward, then everyone's going to cue off of them for, for opinions, and things continue to go forward. So I believe we're, we're, we're going for a bimodal future. More lean forward and more lean back. And we just have to make sure we're not leaning back worse than our parents. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, second question is Barbara. Oh, it's not? Oh, Linda. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, Linda, uh, sorry. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, question about the... Uh, Kutz net curve, yes. income inequality. Yes. What you portrayed there seemed to suggest that it will eventually right itself. It has many times. That, that curve I showed you is showing you writing itself uh, in the previous era uh, of industrialization in the 20th century, from the, from the Industrial Revolution to the 20th century. And then we start these new Kuznets curves as these new phases. Carlota Perez's book on this um, is an excellent book. 
It's on cycles, Carlota Perez. It's uh, technological innovations and cycles or something. And does that mean we shouldn't try and address it? Or does oh, it no, I think we should. Absolutely. Okay. We should recognize it for what it is, though. And say, okay, in 1914, we invented progressive income tax. We oh, invented yeah. it. You make more money, we take more money. And the, the peak of that was Eisenhower in 1950. 90% of marginal income, if you weren't putting it back into a corporation, went to who? After $3 million a year. Yeah. That was pretty awesome, really redistributive. And then they've been dismantling that mm -hmm. ever since. It's just, a, it's just a business. It's just a cycle. We're going to say at some point, hey, that's too much. You've taken too much wealth. It's time to put some of these things back in, and we'll develop these new uh, methods. for. The wealth is there. That's the important point. The okay. wealth uh, is just exploding. about third question? Last question. Okay. Yes. Go ahead. Um, given that Google has already become Skynet, literally, okay. can we really trust them to become the Ministry of Truth as well? No, I totally agree with you. That's <laughs> why I would go to the Brin's concept. Remember Brin's concept that, you know, 20% of the cameras, 20 times many, many of the cameras, 95% of the cameras need to be in your hands, and then you'll vote for more transparency, you know? That's the way these digital twins have got to work. 95% of the AIs that we're using have got to be us using them, choosing them from a federation of competing companies, proprietary and open source, and then we'll let Prism and Sky Google, whatever you want to call it, we'll let those guys be, you know, 5% uh, of the people, okay? And more than 5% of the wealth, 5% of the people, 5% of the minds. And we'll be okay with that. Because the diversity will just continue to blow up if that model continues. So that's the, that's the Evo Devo model. In your own body, only 5% of your genes do this funneling and top down, telling your body what to do. The other 95%, that's so called developmental genetic toolkit. All the rest of your genes, they create, they shuffle around and create a different variety in a tree like exploratory way. So I think this Evo Devo model is kind of most of the future, most of the world, most change, I think is bottom up. And when we think about humanity and how to create more uh, of what we care about, I think we want to empower those bottom-up things as, as fast as we can.